Welcome to the Hank Cisco Show, ladies and gentlemen, don't touch that remote. You know, my show today is going to be about the heart, and uh, we have so many songs that are written about the heart, heart of my heart, and then there was, I left my heart, oh well, <laughs> so we'll, we'll talk about, but today it's, you know, when was the last time you had a doctor visit your house? You don't have, uh, they don't come to your house anymore. But we're coming into your house today with knowledge about your heart, your health, how to take care of yourself, how to stay alive, how to enjoy life. You know, life is beautiful. So while you're here, enjoy life and also take care of your heart. Now, my guest today, I'm going to turn it over to my heart doctor, Dr. Robert Velasco. And then introduce your guest there. Well, this is Dr. Gina Rose. Here, as, here. Okay, go ahead. As a primary care physician. And what we're, we're going to talk about is preventive medicine with respect to cardiovascular disease. Gina's going to talk primarily about uh, the aspect as it relates to primary care. And I'll do talk a little bit about what we do for secondary prevention and somebody who's already had a cardiac or cardiovascular condition to try and prevent future ones. The main things we're trying to prevent are the development of atherosclerosis in the arteries. This is a model of a normal artery, and as time goes by in a high percentage of people, you get plaque forming in the artery, which is on the model is this yellow stuff. And early on, and it can start in men as early as their 20s, it doesn't cause any problem and, or symptoms and nobody knows it's there. But later on, as it progresses and the arteries wow. get blocked up like this, it causes major problems and leads to heart attacks. If this is in the coronary arteries, it leads to heart attacks. These arteries here are coronary arteries which feed the muscle of the heart. The same process can occur in the carotid arteries which feed the brain and also in the arteries in the lower extremities, which can cause poor circulation to those, and actually can also occur to the arteries feeding the kidneys and the intestines. So this is one of the major things we try to prevent. The other is, is in people with high blood pressure, the heart muscle has to work excessively hard, and like any muscle that works hard chronically, it gets thick, just like a weightlifter's arms or shoulders. And the heart, the way it's shaped, does not work well when it gets thick, so that's something else we try to prevent. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Rose, and she can talk about it from the standpoint All right, of... Uh, I have some questions here from the audience, okay? Now, what are the risk factors of for de developing heart disease? That's one, the first question. That's a good question, Hank. Um, my primary responsibility in primary care is preventing the progression of this atherosclerotic plaque in our vessels throughout our body. So understanding what someone's risk is in that progression, how early they're gonna have a problem is, is critical. Some of the risk factors are age, can't control much for age, but right. as we get older, obviously we're gonna have more plaque, potential for plaque buildup. Um, smoking history, it's the number one reversible cause of, that we have control as a person is stopping smoking. So if you smoke, you gotta quit, because you're at risk for developing heart disease, the progression of that is much bigger. Other diagnoses like high blood pressure, as Dr. Velasco mentioned, type 2 and type 1 diabetes, out of control blood sugars are going to increase the acceleration of the development of these plaques. But you're, you're a family physician, mm -hmm. right? And you're Absolutely. located up in Collegeville, right? Yes, I am. Anybody in Collegeville? Dr. Rose. <laughs> so, go ahead. So, my job uh, when I see a patient in the office is to help them develop healthy lifestyles to minimize the, the risk of developing right. these other diagnoses. And then identifying those at higher risk so that we can be more aggressive in that population and making changes early before that plaque starts to develop throughout the body. All right, now you find a problem. They send it over to the difference between a family physician and a heart doctor. Now tell me where you, where you step in. Well. She finds something, right? Suspicious. Dr. Rose sees a population of people that's sort of all comers. Because whereas I see a population of people who are more specifically skewed to having a problem. So to a large degree, somebody has an event where they get something called angina, which is chest discomfort due to blocked up coronaries, 
where they've had a stroke or they've gone into congestive heart failure, developed abnormal rhythms, or maybe they've had a heart attack and needed stents or bypasses or something. And primarily, I do a lot of the management in that person. Tr we call that secondary prevention because we're trying to prevent additional progression of their problem so that they can get back to being healthy and continue to stay healthy after they've had an event. So the population I see is skewed to somebody who's already had an event. Now occasionally I'll see somebody who is just very concerned that they're at risk and we'll get to do primary prevention, but mostly what I do is secondary prevention in people who've already had a problem. Dr. Rose gets to see a much broader population of people where she can pick out people who do fall into the higher risk groups and then yeah, try and initiate. Use high risk. High, well, they have <laughs> maybe high blood pressure or they're smokers or have an unhealthy lifestyle. And then she gets to work with them over a long period of time to try and make their lifestyle much healthier to correct these abnormal factors or at least improve them since sometimes they're not correctable um, to reduce their risks. They reduce their risk in essence of needing me. Well, so it's not the same population. Well, now, how can a, my family physician help me? That's another question from the audience out there. How can my family physician help me prevent heart disease? Well, I think that's a great segue. I want to <coughs> question for what Dr. Belasco was saying. Dr. Belasco sees those patients who already have known heart disease or have an, an, or experiencing symptoms that make me concerned that they're experiencing heart-related dysfunction. So I, I send them to him. But up until that point, I may have identified someone with high blood pressure or diabetes or a smoker and intervene early to minimize that risk yeah. of progression. So my job Exercise. is- Exercise. Absolutely. My job is primary prevention. I want to, in primary prevention, prevent whatever their risk is from creating damage to the organs that we're concerned about. Um, in doing that, it's exactly true. It's, it's exercise, it's eating right, and that primary prevention actually starts in my population in early adolescence right, or right. pediatric stage, because you can see a, a young man at 20 already has evidence of change. So I start in that pediatric population teaching them the, the goals. Yeah. You know, one hour of physical activity every day, whether it's snowing or 100 degrees outside, finding a way to get that in, eating five servings of fruits and vegetables a day, not smoking if they haven't started, you know, teaching them to avoid it and, and coping mechanisms for that pressure that they might experience through school. But start early, develop healthy habits when they're young, then it's not as hard to change as they get older and that progression, the development and the progression is delayed in time. So I'm hoping my patients never have to see Dr. Velasco, right. but then the key is when they do have an event or a problem or are a higher risk, I know when to send them to him good, so that good. we can so, intervene. Give me, let me, give me that second up there. Let me that. Now, you're talking to a guy that had a, now, where was I? I was 75% right here. Can you believe that? When I, when I was boxing and uh, police work, that's my heart was like that. I was all right, everything, the blood and everything was going by. And then as I got older and whatever it was, can I believe when, they, when Dr. Blasco told me that, Hank, we're gonna have to uh, operate, you know, I, uh, Dr. Anderson, okay? So I met Dr. Anderson, and this is what, like 75. <laughs> and uh, so I'm still here. And, uh, oh my God, here. And uh, now, I'm, I'm having a little, uh, my, my symptoms when I, was it I was getting tired, I could get the top of the steps, I was tired walking, and uh, after the operation, I was okay. But uh, within the last three or four weeks, I walk and I get a little tired. So I'm gonna have to make an appointment with you, maybe tomorrow or the next day, you know. See, well, I wanna be around for, for uh, my 27th year with the TV here. So, doctor, what, what do you, uh, what is the most important thing for per people to prevent this getting a heart attack like that. I mean, the, yeah, I know you have to live a, a nice life and all, but there's a couple of basic things. The um, scary thing about this is that autopsy studies that were done on American GIs who died in Vietnam and also the same data in Korea 
showed that by the age of 27, about 45% of American men already had early plaque in their arteries, and they were only 27. Um, that data might not be as bad right now because since the Vietnam data is my generation, I'm, I, and all the guys I know of who were over there, most of them smoked, as Dr. Rose just mentioned. And smoking is a huge risk factor for getting this. Smoke. Smoking. There's a the biochemical effects of the, the chemicals that absorb into your bloodstream from smoking and also the reduced oxygen levels create an, ab an abnormal environment for the wall of the artery as the blood goes through in, in there, which irritates and inflames the wall of the artery, which leads to the plaque formation. And other th uh, the other factors for forming a lot of plaques in the arteries are the wear and tear that occurs when you have about 100,000 heartbeats a day and somebody owes high blood pressure because it beats up the inside of the artery. So the high blood pressure is also traumatizing the artery itself. And then people who have high cholesterol, the cholesterol also has biochemical effects that cr cholesterol. create inflammation in the wall of the artery that leads to the plaque buildup. And diabetics are at extremely high risk for this. And because the population in America has gotten more and more obese, the um, incidence of diabetes in the age of onset is much more than it used to be. And it's occurring in much younger people than we used to see it. So diabetes is a major factor. And, and then the factor we can't control for is genetics, because some people's family are very predisposed towards this, and others are much less predisposed. But you can't really control for your genes. You're born with yeah. whatever you're born with. So the critical things in prevention, mostly what Dr. Rose was talking about, and she's able to do in a much larger, broader population than I can, is to try and pe have people have a much healthier lifestyle. And I think exercise is critically important. I think eating a diet that's relatively healthy, that is much lower in fat than is kind of pretty common in the United States now, lower in salt because salt leads to a lot of the high blood pressure we see, and trying to avoid obesity because obesity strongly predisposes to diabetes. The blood pressure tends to be higher. A lot of people who are obese get something called sleep apnea, which is another cardiac risk factor in those who have that. Um, probably a few more things I can't think of right off the top of my head, but there's so much obesity in the population, and I'll tell you it's keeping us busy uh, because the obesity leads to all, really contributes to all these other risk factors that contribute to this. So the critical thing is trying to get people when they're much younger, because as I said, these plaques start, uh, at least in males when, when they're, don't in, wait there. right, and the males in their 20s, and the majority of women don't have too much problem, unless they're heavy smokers, until they're probably getting near menopause. Or, but the issue is, for women, it's just as important as men, though, because although women tend to have less problems with plaques, when they're younger, they catch up very quickly after menopause, so that the most common cause of death in women, as well as men, is cardiovascular disease. So it's just as important in women. They just tend to be a little bit older when they start to manifest problems than men. You know, I, I, when I opened the show, I said, life is, is beautiful. I love, I love life, I enjoy it. And when Dr. Anderson told me 15 years ago, they wouldn't have operated on me because I was 90 years old. I'm 91 now, I'm still bobbing and weaving. But now you tell me that when you were in training to be a doctor, what was the age limit they cut off well, I was at the to a risk? I was at the University of North Carolina and our surgeons down there, this was 1978, felt that anybody over 65 years old was too old wow. for open heart surgery. So we should be happy that the, the medical profession is always moving forward. You know, coming up with new, what they say, you know, keep abreast with what's going on. And I think, I think the medical, now you're at, at Einstein Hospital. Tell me something about Einstein, all, some of the nice things up there. Well, in terms of interventions, we have, um, as you just mentioned, Dr. Anderson and his surgical team can do all these new techniques that you hear about. And I think you had a show on with some of them a few yeah, weeks the ago. Yeah, show's on the, uh, tonight, you yeah. know. But we have, um, they can do robotic open heart surgery. They can put in heart valves with very small incisions. Um, in fact, the majority of the surgery they do, the incisions are very, very small. Yes. They're not the traditional right. sternotomy, but some people still need that. Um, we have a heart attack program where if people arrive at the hospital with a heart attack, 
um, we usually are able to have the artery opened in about 58 to 60 minutes. The national guidelines are for 90 minutes, but our record there is a, it's very close to about 60 minutes. The national average is actually 107 minutes. The guideline is 90 minutes, and we're at about 60. If you get the artery opened right away in an acute heart attack, you can save the majority yeah. of the heart muscle. We also have a stroke program, and now we can get the, if the people come That's within it. the first few hours, mm -hmm. you also had a program on that. That's up in, in, in yeah. And we have that. They didn't have it in Montgomery. Right. Because well, I we had they the, didn't do no heart operation. No, we had the heart attack program at Montgomery. Huh? Well, the heart attack program was at Montgomery. Yeah. We have, we, the heart attack program we just brought over from Montgomery, that was there. The heart surgery we did not have. No. But the heart attack program we absolutely did have. You had it Montgomery. Absolutely. Well, what do you mean? What was the difference the, between that? There was no difference. The patients got to the emergency room. They were diagnosed immediately. They went right to the cath lab 24 hours a day. Catheterization and then the artery they was open. someplace else. No, no. Only no. if they needed open heart surgery. We opened the arteries at Montgomery, put stents in. Most of the people oh. get stents. Only if the person had a problem which would require open heart surgery, like bypass that group we were transferring. But the majority of the people were opened up promptly with stents. And we had that program. We started with thrombolytic drugs in 1983, which I had started. And then we switched it to going right to the cath lab in about 2003. So I, actually, I, we just brought that program over from Montgomery. I, you know, I, I, I had to thank you because you, 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 you're like a traffic cop. You saw, saw there was a violation, two violations. Number one. My heart wasn't boop, 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 beating right after my hip operation with Dr. Paleo. In fact, Dr. Paleo is going to be in my show next week, talking about hip. Uh, and you recommended that I get a pacemaker. Yeah. Okay. Now, then the second time I went to, you told me I got recommended you had to get the, heart, the bypass. Now, the bypass. I was thinking that always they get the. Zipper club, you know, when they get over here, mm -hmm. cut it open here, open up, boom, 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 right? But no, I had to, at the operation, I'm looking, I'm looking for the zipper club, it wasn't there. It was a little bit of a, that big. So that's another advancement, you know. It's the same thing with the, with my hip replacement. The first one was eight years, and I had a lot of pain. I was in the hospital three or four days, and the convalescent was longer. Eight years later, the other hip went, and next thing you know, three days in the hospital, convalescent less, no pain. So, you know, life is beautiful. I can't wait till something else happens. No, I won't say that. <laughs> so go ahead, doctor. Go ahead. Tell me more about you. Tell you, tell me, tell you about me. Um, I, think, I think one of the, the best joys I have in practicing medicine is being able to identify those people at risk help them see where they can intervene and, ha and maintain control over that risk and uh -huh. make improvements towards getting them well so that there isn't this, this problem with end organ damage later on. And seeing them sort of the light go on where they do have control over a lot of these issues. A lot of people come in and they're afraid to seek help. They're afraid to find out what's going on. They're afraid to make change. But the change isn't as onerous as a lot of people anticipate it to be. Uh -huh. Little interventions can go a long way. So even just simply cutting back a little bit on the fatty intake and exercising a little bit more, you don't have to reach that ideal body weight or that ideal body mass index to make a significant improvement. Just five to 10% of a change causes a significant decrease in the amount of medications and your heart risk. All right, now I just got a question from the audience. Read it. What early warning tests will my primary care doc give? What? That's a good question. So if somebody comes into my office and say they're coming in for a well visit, I'm going to look for their, I'm going to try to assess their cardiovascular risks. In doing so, I'm going to get a good dietary history, a good exercise history, and a good family history. But part of that also is that social history. You know, are they smoking? Did they ever, was there an exposure at home when they were growing up? Because that also adds to their risk. And then based on, on that, I'll order some so, sort of some assessment blood work. Um, it's really important that the labs are done fasting. They don't have to be, but a fasting blood work is going to give us a little bit more information. And with that, I'm looking for things that I might not see or hear on, on their history of physical exam part. So I'm looking at their cholesterol levels, where their blood sugar is, 
A lot of yeah. times people are falling in that gray zone now where they don't have diabetes, but their blood sugars aren't normal. And it's that pre-diabetic right. range that we really can make some aggressive intervention. And I got that all that. I got diabetes and all that stuff, you know, so it's all working good. <laughs> right. And then, you know, managing their blood pressure and, and right. on the physical exam, I'm looking at that. So right. some of the primary tests that I do to look for those early warning signs are look at what their risk is, both um, by history, by lab studies and then by diagnostics. If I'm seeing anything or hearing anything on their history that's concerning or their physical exam, then I may send them for a chest x-ray or an echocardiogram. Um, a stress test is a great right. way to see that when they exercise, how Keep does their prepared. blood flow change with the exercise? Is, it, is there a You get all this information and it all goes to the that it, it, it referred to. Well, then they come right. back usually and I, and I talk to them about th this is this is what I've heard this is what I've gotten on exam and these are what the study results that I'm seeing mm -hmm. now let's reevaluate where your risk is and what we need to do from there so so sort of strategizing what the next step is do we intervene with med management um, counseling with diet and exercise and give us some time to see if these people can intervene or make a change or is there a concern great enough that there isn't time for these changes to have created an effect, but I'll send them to Dr. Belasco or one of his partners for more invasive right. testing. Now talk about partners. Tell me, <clears throat> your staff, how many people you got working in your, uh, we call it a team, right? Tell me something about that. Well, my group, we have um, two, two of my partners just do electrophysiology, which is abnormal heart rhythms, pacemakers, ablations, um, things of that sort. and. Two, uh, three of my partners are interventional, which means they do the cardiac catheterizations, the angioplasties, and the stents. And one of them does peripheral arterial interventions as well as Dr. McGargie. Um, and then the rest of us all just do general cardiology, which is seeing patients, following them along, managing them both in the hospital if they're ill or for their office visits to try and optimize their, their level of care with respect to all these different issues we've been talking about. Um, but, we're, but and that's the majority of us in the practice of the general cardiologist like I am. All right, now another, another question from the audience. You read it out and you answer it. Oops. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. It says, can you be more specific about some lifestyle changes? Well, actually, Dr. Rose just mentioned one. It would, if people could get approximately an hour a day, and it doesn't actually have to be a consecutive hour, of some sort of exercise where they get their heart rate up, it could be brisk walking, it could be swimming, it could be bicycling, it could be going to a gym. It could be actually anything, and it could be something different every day. But that helps tremendously with weight control and lowering blood pressure risk, lowering diabetic risks. I think the physical fitness is probably that is the single most important thing there is to do for long-term health. In fact, physical fitness is the only thing even been shown to reduce the risk of Alzheimer's which is, of course, not what we're talking about today. But the physical fitness is really critically important um, from that standpoint. It doesn't have to be a specific exercise. You know, the younger people might go running, older people or anybody could just do walking. But walking briskly and continuously, walking in the, sh in the supermarket or in the, sh in the malls is walking slowly and then stopping and walking slowly and stopping. Or even walking dogs sometimes doesn't count that much because the dogs are always stopping mm -hmm. to urinate or uh, to smell the trees or whatever. So it's not continuous, but something like the continuous walking, or it could be bicycling, or even I, just I, cutting I the grass vigorously. Go ahead. What was it? Even cutting grass, you know, walking behind a mower or something like that. Okay. Now I have another one. How is a primary doctor involved in the post-operation recovery? Excellent question. I, well, let me, I always remember that uh, the aftercare is just as important as the operation. I remember um, in boxing, if a guy had a cut eye, he would have to take care of that. If he didn't take care of it, it's going to keep breaking open every time he fights. See, so what, right. what, what, you're, you're a follow-up. Now, same thing with me. I mean, my Dr. Melnick, he follows up after they took care of me here. So, so, so after there's been an event and an intervention, you're recovering from that, that intervention. My goal is to number there's a multiple factors involved make sure that there aren't any complications from from the procedure for example the boxer is a cut don't want them to get infected don't want them to keep breaking open 
Um, so I'm looking for complications, even with a surgical incision, make sure that it's healing appropriately, make sure that you're tolerating and able to do the wound care appropriately. I'm looking for complications of the procedure where maybe it didn't work or your symptoms persist. So symptom monitoring is important and med management is important too because these people, you know, they may come in and see me more often than they see their cardiologist. I have more time to be able to, to get from them right, information right. regarding <coughs> symptoms. And sometimes it's easier access too. So they may call me and say, look doc, I'm more short of breath this week than I was last week. Yeah. I'll get them in and do an evaluation and assessment to make sure that they're progressing appropriately. The other part of it, and this is a big part of it, is I'm looking not just at the cardiovascular disease, but I'm looking at the body as, as the person as a whole. So whereas we, they might be getting appropriate effective care for what's going on cardiac wise, their kidney function may be failing, or they may have complications regarding their limited mobility post-op or post-intervention, and now their pains are worse. Um, or they may have some gastritis related to the stress and everything they went through. So my job is not just then to address what's going on from a cardiovascular standpoint, but to make sure that I'm not missing any of these other components and that I'm dealing with them and treating them effectively. You may recover from your heart, but then if you die from a bleeding ulcer, it hasn't really benefited you. So my job in primary care, in the aftercare, is to look at the person as a whole and make sure that the, the treatment for the heart is not adversely affecting another organ system or another part of their body or another symptom manifestation. How about Dr. Blasco, uh, Einstein Hospital is up, uh, always something new. What's the latest thing that, that's on the front burner or something you think that's going to be developed a little bit more? Uh, uh, right now. I told me that I, I can't, I got a, I got a pacemaker, so I can't get an MRI, but I can get a, a CAT scan. What's What's the difference, you know? Well, you would do an MRI or a CAT scan if you're trying to look at some part of the body. Um, like if you're worried about somebody had lung cancer, you might want to do a, a scan to get a better idea of what something on a chest x-ray looks like, or somebody has cerebral symptoms to see if they've had a stroke or an aneurysm or something like that. And CAT scans and MRIs are both ways of imaging, but because the MR the M stands for magnetic and the R is resonance, the magnet can have a negative effect on the pacemaker. So we usually don't do MRs in people who do we have pacemakers. Do that, right. More often <clears throat> than not, you can get reasonably comparable information from, from doing the CT scans most of the time. I would say more than 90% of the time you can get the information you need from doing a CT scan. They both are kind of different technologies to look at somewhat similar things and each one has an advantage over the other but um, the, the group who has a pacemaker we can't do that but if somebody has a stent they can get an MR if, oh, yeah. if they have a stent in there but it's just the pacemaker right now the pacemaker companies are trying to develop um, characteristics which will make them amenable to doing MR in terms of the cardiology at, at, at Einstein that we're working on, Dr. Vergana specifically, my partner, is um, some techniques to get arteries that have been chronically occluded open, arteries that we haven't been able to get open with the techniques we've had with the different kinds of catheters that that's they the use to try and get an artery. Front. We're talking <coughs> about an artery that's been occluded for a long time, and um, he's starting to be able to do those. I, All right, our half hour is over. I'll give you 30 seconds. To wrap it up. What do you think? I think if... Uh, People take really good care of themselves when they're younger and do all the things Dr. Rose has mentioned. I think they're a lot less likely to need me. Hi. I, I want to concur with that and say it's never too young to begin intervening for your heart health as you get older. And um, parents out there of young children setting good examples and modeling appropriate behavior helps those kids develop healthy habits. So we won't be living to 100 years old. We'll be living to 120. I'm, their time. I'm ready to roll. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, thanks a lot for allowing us to come in your home and, uh, you know, keep your heart pumping, no problem. And uh, uh, I, I have to make an appointment with you to one day and with another couple of days and see what's what. I always good good to get a checkup. So until we meet again, let's have it to, uh, they say in Italian, alla salute. So that means to your health. And if you got good health, you got everything.
Thank you very much, and may God bless each and every one.